started with this yeah. one, um, the one in Norfolk grant, yeah. and everything was in here. Mm -hmm. The DVIC grant is back through that hallway. Go ahead, Chris, take us in there. I'm just kind of holding this door so we don't whack anybody. Okay. So the grants really made the difference in your ability to yes. make the decision. Yes, that got us going. It really did. Yeah. So this came basically as a, you know, the, the shipping container shows up and about a week later, once you hook up the electric and the plumbing and the mm -hmm. drains, it ends up um, going, came is with this these two. Here? This is a separator. Oh, that's a separator. It's yeah. probably 50s vintage. Um, but that's what allows us to make the reduced fat milk. Uh huh. And also make cream. Two pasteurizing vats, they're on their side right now. Yeah. And uh, those allow us to make the volume. Mm -hmm. That's 150 gallons each. And so doing high volume, because these bagging boxes are five gallons each, mm -hmm. um, doing the high volume, uh, we needed bigger vats. And so the grant helped us get that. Mm -hmm. So there's not much to it. We catch the milk. Yeah. The milk is right in this line right now. But we hook it up to there and then tip. We tip it down See, into the yeah. vat so we don't have to carry milk cans. And once they're full, then we, if it's chocolate, we mix it. The reduced well, fat. Well, so you do the chocolate yourself here too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We use cocoa powder, cane sugar, uh -huh. and, uh, um, salt. <clears throat> Four ingredients. Mm -hmm. And then for the schools, we have to add vitamins A and D mm -hmm. um, because it's reduced fat. Whole fat milk has what it needs in it. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Designed that way. So, anyway. It's pretty good. Pretty straightforward. So, where do you do the bottling? Okay, the bottling is over in here now. So, this is the raw product, and the pasteurized product is in here. The milk comes over on this line mm -hmm. and uh, goes through the tube coolers. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into this is the bottling machine. We modify it for bags versus. Mm -hmm bags versus uh, bottles mm -hmm. and then once it's bottled um, that comes in here in the fridge so up right here yeah. so this is actually a oh, very tired box so yeah. we do the bag and box with the rubber hoses yeah this is the one the sample in, but this is what this is what the schools will get. Yeah. It's a box like this with the, the so little rubber hose comes out of the top. That's easy to get. Yeah, I mean they're five gallons of about forty-five pounds, but um, so that's the chocolate and then the one percent this one. So anyway. The school is it the chocolate to the schools? Yeah. But it's chocolate skin. Yeah. Which is disgusting. <laughs> I'm, I'm with it. Okay. This so we're going to all out to everybody who wants to drink milk. We don't have to drink these. We have coffee milk, which is my favorite. Or maple milk. Maple milk, which is one gallon of syrup, 25 gallons of milk. Okay. We'll go out and make sure you have the maple milk. Yeah, the maple one. Yeah, and I want to get a little closer up so we can see the cover. That was actually a. Alright. Yeah. So, that was actually a maple leaf from one of our trees. I just scanned it directly in on the scanner. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Peter, right on the right, there's a basket or two of cookies my mother-in-law made for us to have milk Better and cookies. That. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, wow. we're just bringing out the chocolate. So, I am so excited. Having <laughs> <laughs> this cookie and this maple milk. Oh, my God. You know what? It's really, I got to confess, I'm on the clock. This is called work. I'm having I'm here at the Miller Farm, the Miller Extended Family, and uh, talking about milk in Vermont. It's, it's really fun. I mean, I got a good job. You know what I mean? 
Uh, I am excited. I was talking to Pete, and I have memories when I first came to Vermont. Um, it's your great, your great uncle. My great uncle. Your great uncle, Melvin Miller, he used to be a side judge, and I'd be at Fort County, and Melvin would uh, kind of check me out, ask me why I was one of those liberals, you know? <laughs> we had a really good time. But it's so amazing, the Miller Farm and the families, you've got uh, you and your brother are actively farming here. And it's so important that we keep local dairy and local farming going as much as we possibly can. That's really something that we don't want to ever give up on in Vermont, ever, ever, ever. But in order to do it, uh, it it's going to take more than just hard work by the middle family. It's going to take markets. And one of the things that uh, the Miller farm here uh, has pioneered is getting local milk to our schools. And farm to school is probably one of the best ways to create uh, that loop of the market uh, in production. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, with the Northern, uh, the, the Innovation Center, the Dairy Innovation Center that we got into uh, the law about five years ago, we've got to get reestablished. With their help, they came up uh, with the equipment about $233,000 uh, to make it possible for you to have the equipment you needed to do the separation to be able to then uh, get that local milk, and this is a person on the dairy farm, uh, to our schools. So kids are drinking very nutritional milk from down the road. That's more or less the way it is. So what the, the Dairy Innovation Center is all about is trying to come up with creative but really practical ways to help the farmers sell their products. And by the way, organic milk is incredibly nutritious. And, uh, and I'm just delighted that the Dairy Innovation Center uh, saw the Miller Project as something that was going to be really beneficial to the farm, to the kids, uh, and to the local community and the environment. So our goal, we're now in the midst of considering another farm, bill, and it's always hard, very contentious. But what I find is the area of common ground when I'm talking to my colleagues, whether they're from United States or New States, is there's a real appreciation for the effort that goes into local farming production and where we can find ways to help those local farmers have a market. That's an area where I find common ground. So we'll keep pushing to get, uh, not only to get the farm bill passed, but to have an increase in the allocation of funding for the Dairy Innovation Center. And this is like exhibit A. Uh, this is like a good day of how it actually can work. So, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you everybody for the work that you do. Uh, who's, who's next? Laura. 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 Okay, Laura. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, right, I've, I've never done, you know, a press conference with a delicious cookie and maple milk, but, you know, I think it's something we may want to integrate into everyday <laughs> deal, okay? <laughs> So I'm Laura Ginsberg. I'm the uh, Dairy Strategy and Innovation Manager at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, where I lead the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center team. And I'm, I'm just so proud of the work that our center does. We were awarded competitively in 2019, and we've been underway really um, since 2021, so we were hoping 2020 would be the year we got started, we got a little sidetracked, but since 2021, we have been really actively supporting projects uh, like the Miller Farm Project, farm-based projects, processor technical assistance projects across the 11 state region that we represent from Pennsylvania, Maryland in the south up to Maine in the north. We've received a total of $45.8 million worth of federal funds. And by the end of this year, that number will be over 50 million. We've so far distributed, and these are active grant funds on the ground, over $28 million um, worth of projects. That being said, we've had a total request of 72 million. So we know that the demand and the need far exceeds what we're able to fund. I did want to highlight a few projects. Um, our average grant award is just under $100,000. So these aren't huge, huge grants. We have grants ranging in size from about $5,000 on the low end to a million dollars on the high end. 
So some of the projects that we're really proud of, uh, we support cohort-based technical assistance. And this allows farmers and processors to engage with their peers and receive both uh, peer, so peer-to-peer -peer and one-on-one -on -one technical assistance on particular topics. We had one farmer that participated in the pilot <coughs> cohort who was moving his cows outside for the very first time on his multi-generational farm. And in the first year of receiving that technical assistance to get his cows outside, he saved $34,000 in fees. So that's huge for a small yeah. farm. We also do grants for marketing and branding. So for processors to improve their brand presence on the store shelves, one of our core tenants is that we want our products to connect with consumers. And we also know that small processors oftentimes don't have the time or money to spend on improving their brand presence and marketing um, appeal of their products. So we provide small grants, $50,000, the recipients are required to work with a, a marketing and branding professional and they can do any really anything so it can be e-commerce it can be uh, total brand redesign it can be uh, trade show materials and what we've seen is that these projects increase sales well beyond the cost of the grant so we have one recipient down in rhode island whose average sales per year were seven hundred and fifty thousand and they're on track to top a million um, the first year after their grant. We had another uh, recipient, a very small uh, farm that or, or butter processor who received a grant to increase their e-commerce and immediately their sales more than doubled. So really awesome success there. I also wanna talk about the processor expansion grants. This was a direct outcome of the uh, the departure of Horizon from this region and USDA asked us to come up with uh, a request for what we could do to stabilize the organic market. And what we know is organic is very dependent on the conventional supply chain for processing and distribution. And what people said to us was, we need to invest in processing. We need to stabilize processing in the region to keep our farmers safe with markets for their milk. And last year we announced $12.2 million in grants for processors across the region for projects that will immediately increase their demand and processing of locally sourced milk. And that's for uh, everything from organic yogurt and ice cream all the way uh, to powdered products that are gonna move out to the international markets. And finally, uh, as our name belies, we do uh, invest in innovation, things like school milk through this project. We have another school milk project going on in New York that's working on low sugar, aseptic flavored milk to move into school markets that don't have access to a local farm like we are so lucky to have here in Vermont. And we've invested in packaging innovation to reduce the amount of plastics going into dairy packaging, sensory research on the types of products that consumers want in specialty cheese, and robotics and technology on processing uh, facilities and on farms to really increase innovation and opportunity there. So we love the work we do. Uh, it's really awesome and uh, excited to have it continue into the next uh, few years and fingers crossed about the next farm bill as well. And then I think I introduce Harley. So Harley Sterling is the nutrition director for Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union. Highly decorated. <laughs> <laughs> he is an advocate and committed to purchasing local food for schools, including milk, cheese, beef, maple, and produce. 31% of the school food budget is uh, coming from local sources. That's really high. That's great. Thank you. And that number is actually the highest in the state, and Harley is uh, a very modest uh, but well-respected leader in the Vermont school, school food space and the nation recognized by uh, leadership in, in Vermont and by the USDA. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Senator Welch. It's definitely the best introduction I've ever had. Um, <laughs> so it's an honor to be speaking here as part of this lineup. Um, in behalf of my school district, WNESU, um, I just sort of want to recap that, you know, this all started like last spring, well, for me, sitting right over there, in the mud on some milk crates, uh, <laughs> having lunch with meeting Farmer Pete here for the first time. I thought that was just great. But it's like, well, where are we gonna meet? Well, here's some milk crates and we sat right there. Um, and we had this wild idea of serving um, organic 
fluid milk in all of our schools. Um, and, you know, to be honest, it was a little bit more of a question at the time, like, okay, are we really gonna do this? Is this really gonna work? Um, but it seemed like a heavy lift, but I just had a feeling that we could do it and we could make it work. Um, so, you know, I think we all felt the weight of the project at first. It was pretty unheard of to do organic milk um, in this area. I had never heard of anyone doing it. And, you know, even though my, my whole food career, I've been a proponent of serving local food and I cared about organic. Um, I even volunteered on an organic farm when I was 24. So, you know, I was familiar with it, but it was really through meeting these fine folks um, that I really got to hear the stories and understand the real meaning of what organic means um, to the dairy industry specifically um, in terms of animal welfare and living conditions and, you know, access to graze on the pastures and things and just all these things that I hadn't known as a chef um, were a part of the organic label for food. So talking to Pete and Olga and Helen and, and everyone who was involved in this project really inspired me um, with the story that I wanted to bring to um, our kids in our schools. So um, we started out the pilot doing five of our six schools and uh, I was a little nervous about starting it in our, in our sixth school, which was our middle school, just because it's a busy school, age group. Um, you know, I wasn't really sure that it was the right fit, so I wanted to do a soft start. So we started out in five schools, and it was really with a conversation that I had um, with our manager at the middle school, who said to me, we want this for our kids. Why does every other school get it? We want it here and I, I shared my concerns and she's like, no, we want this for our kids too. We're gonna make it happen. And they did. And by January, we were up and running in all six schools plus a seventh in Brattleboro that we um, bring meals to. And uh, we kind of let the program run wild. Um, if you know anything about K-12 education in Vermont, every school develops its own way of doing things. <laughs> um, but we wanted to see it happen in all of its iterations. We wanted to embrace the idea that this was a pilot. What's it gonna look like across many different situations and landscapes? So um, so we let it go and we, we saw things like breakfast in the classroom working. We saw breakfast in the cafeteria, we saw second chance breakfast, um, and we saw schools that wanted to offer mostly white milk, and then some others who were like, no, we wanna do chocolate every day. So we basically had seven different schools and 14 different ways of doing things. <laughs> <laughs> One thing they all had in common though, is it was working. Um, the seventh graders weren't throwing cups of milk at each other. Uh, the kindergartners weren't spending all day drenched from spills mostly. And uh, of course the elephant in the room, our food costs weren't spiraling, spiraling out of control. You know, at the onset, that was gonna be the, the biggest issue we identified was the fact that carton conventional milk we had been buying was about four and a half dollars a gallon. And, you know, we were looking at maybe twice that for organic. So we were really concerned, but we saw over the course of the year, I just audited the numbers yesterday, less than a 5% increase in cost. Wow. Yeah. Why? Explain yeah, attributed that. to yeah. why? Yeah. Largely attributed to reduction in waste. Um, through the Offer Versus Serve program that USDA um, has as a flexibility for school lunch and breakfast, kids can choose components that they want and there's something about getting milk in a cup that they just don't throw it away as much. We saw almost zero waste. So consider too the fact that we didn't start at our middle school, which is our largest volume school until January. The acceleration of savings was missed until more than halfway through the year. So there's a good chance we could have done this at cost neutral, serving organic fluid milk every day in every single school. So I don't wanna go on and on, but I'll just say that um, Senator Welch's point about markets and increasing them, the United States National School Lunch Program is the largest restaurant in the world. I say this a lot. 100,000 franchises basically, which is more than all the Starbucks, McDonald's, and Subways combined. Um, and the median school district size is about the same as us, 1,100. Um, so not every school lives next to 
world famous farms and not every school is in Vermont where we have all this support, all these great NGOs supporting the work we do. But um, in terms of markets, that's a pretty that's a pretty compelling number to think about and how the, this pilot sort of demonstrated that it is, um, is certainly possible. So farm to school culture in Vermont, local foods incentive grants that we have passed here, and then of course, universal school meals, which makes it so that every kid in our schools here in Vermont um, knows that they have access to this food and never has to go through what my friend, former colleague in Burlington, Heather Torrey, used to tell a story about this kid who would come through the line, had to give his milk back and said, oh, I thought the milk came with school. Hmm. Nice. We don't have to face that anymore here in Vermont. We're very thankful for that and we're thankful for the work of, of all of you. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to one of my personal heroes here. Definitely a role model for professionalism and just uh, unbelievably knowledgeable Olga Moriarty from the Northeast Organic Family Farm Partnership. It's a mouthful. Not to be confused with NOFA. Exactly. Thank you. NOFA did come first. We have the same, many same words in our <laughs> titles, but NOFA's been doing this for like 40 years and the partnership's only been here since the Horizon contracts, which was just three years ago. Um, I'm Olga Moriarty, so our organization is the Northeast Organic Family Farm Partnership, and we were founded when Horizon moved out of the region um, by Gary Hirschberg, who was the founder of Stonyfield. Um, I see you here today, Jeremy. So, so Stonyfield is also kind of woven into this story in that the Miller Farm is a supplier to Stonyfield and is part of the reason why we could make this pilot possible. Um, the mission for our organization is to increase the demand for organic milk that's produced in the Northeast. Um, I was, we were not the only organization that was part of this to support this pilot. Uh, Nova Vermont played an enormous part as well as Farm to Institution New England. Um, but I would say that, you know, farmers are strapped. Food service directors are, you know, working on very slim budgets and, um, you know, this is very challenging work. And part of the beauty of this pilot was that there's a lot of groups that came together to make it happen. There's a wonderful collaborative effort um, that unfolded here, and I know that we feel very honored to have been a part of it, but it's a critical part to if this was to continue, there really needs to be community partners that are involved in projects like this. Um, I'm just gonna be very, I'll be very quick and just say that, you know, our focus has been around organic dairy. Um, in Vermont, we, we work throughout the whole entire region, but in Vermont, we've lost about half of our dairies in the last 10 years. Uh, and that losing any dairies is always a tragedy, but particularly when we're losing our organic dairies, you know, some of our, our best pasture management um, people, uh, it, it's, it's really tragic. And we um, have lost uh, 40, 70 of them since 2020. That's about 40% of our organic dairy producers in the state of Vermont in four years. Um, so this is the critical time to creating new markets um, for dairy producers and our organic dairy um, you know, they are specifically committed to building soil matter, keeping air and water clean, reducing the use of fossil fuels, chemical inputs in our food system. Um, I, I refer to them as grass farmers. You know, they're focused on growing healthy pastures. There's a lot of talk about resiliency in the food system. Our organic dairy producers are focused on this resiliency, which means that they're more, they're better prepared for our extreme weather events, the droughts and the floods and everything that the new climate wants to throw at us. Um, it is the agriculture of the future and it's absolutely worth the investment. Um, I would also say organic is a, a model that allows farmers to choose to stay small if they want to and stay as a family run operation. Um, there's not this intense pressure to keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the average herd size of an organic dairy in the Northeast is about 70 cows. So it's proof that they can stay small if they want to. Um, and clearly, you know, the smaller, these, these farms are keeping the cows on the pasture, which is always a beautiful thing to see, but also it's better, better for our health and better for the environment. Um, just, I wanted to just quickly tag on to um, Harley and talking about this as a, a food access issue. You know, this is organic dairy in public schools, which means suddenly this, this, this premium for organic um, goes away and we're able to hand not just local milk, but local and organic milk over to students, um, opening up the threshold and, and sort of um, dispelling this myth that organic is only for the wealthy. Um, I think it proves a lot that um, it also, we're creating a system here that as Harley says is, to, it can be cost neutral when you're going from cartons of milk 
into this bulk milk, which could be bulk in five gallon bags, or it could be a gallon jug, but it is a different model than these little cartons because there's much less waste, which is then allowing us to, to have organic milk in schools. It's an incredible model, and the time to, to, to work on this project is now. Um, there's also the talk of, 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 of fewer cartons in the world being made. So this is a time to be moving into bulk for sure. And it, the moment is to seize it for organic for sure. Um, I just want to thank DBIC and cannot stress enough about how this project would not be possible without the funding from DBIC. And Senator, I know you're a big supporter. I can't you know, like encourage you enough to be continue to being a champion for this, um, as well as the Organic Market Development Program, which is another critical piece to solving right. some of these issues. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, to, to Peter and to Harley, um, this really shows an example of, it's an inspiring example of hard work, determination, collaboration. So often in the news, we hear these stories of how hard it is to stay, you know, afloat as a farmer. And um, here we are celebrating the fact that we're bringing organic milk into schools, we're innovating, we're creating new processing lines, uh, and we're serving healthy milk to hundreds maybe thousands of kids in Vermont who now are understanding where their milk is coming from and drinking a really healthy product. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was a part of the pilot. And I'm going to hand it over to Pete and also say it's your birthday. <laughs> so happy birthday. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, I don't know, does anybody else feel like they have things to say or questions? All on you, Pete. All on me. <laughs> well, we got 15 minutes. I think <laughs> we I have, think we like can. We have you have to. You got five minutes. <laughs> yeah, because okay. we have to be the next place. Okay. Sorry. Well, we we do have a restroom if anybody needs it in that barn. Um, I'm just grateful that you came out here. I'm grateful for each of the people here, and um, Lou and I say uh, helped also a lot with the grant writing, and I'm glad to have her here. And I've got worker, a couple workers here. Hey guys, Mira and Tyler. <laughs> And uh, Mira says she met you once before. Um, what, where, where was it, Mira? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, anyway. So, and I'm, I appreciate the press coming out, listening to what's important to us. I do know that, um, for me, it's, it's important to get kids drinking milk again. Um, so much of the world is based on stimulants and all these sorts of things. It's good to have, I don't know, just a, a natural whole product um, that the average kid can get access to. And it makes me feel good to be creating a generation of milk drinkers. And I think it's great to have a, a you know, whole milk for the kids because then it tastes a lot better and probably more nutritious. And then they can maybe become lifetime milk drinkers. Anyway, and I, I do cherish many of you as, as close friends. I also want to recognize Jeremy. Jeremy is one of those farmers that went out. Wow. I'm glad Stonyfield picked him up, but that's the face of somebody who couldn't make it go with the economics of organic farming. And uh, Thank you. That, Thank that's you. incredibly hard. He and I talked before he quit. Wow. It's just, um, I'm glad Stonyfield picked him up. He's going to do a great job there, but I think he probably would have rather had a better price for his product. And, and uh, he's a good farmer. The people who go out now are all good farmers. It's not like the scum of the earth they quit. We've, we've, considered, um, we've considered throwing in the towel a few times ourselves in the past few years, even with all this. And um, it's just hard. Yeah, it's hard. Very, very hard. And that's why what we're doing here is so absolutely, absolutely critical. You need a huge loss. So I appreciate the work that Olga's doing trying to expand the organic market. Yeah. And of course, Harley coming over and doing that. But anyway, it's great to celebrate this moment. Thank you. Thank you really so is. much. And I recommend yep. the organic maple. <laughs> <laughs> Until you the taste turkeys. the chocolate. Yeah. More of the coffee. That's or right. The... <laughs> you know, let's all get in front of the truck and take a picture of everybody, including these guys. So okay, all right. Come on over. Okay. All right.